Well, it is a blessing to be here at 3 Abian Camp Meeting. Um, I am so thrilled to be here. Right now, Amazing Facts is doing their camp meeting over here, and little did I know I would be here at 3 Abian Camp Meeting. So I'm, I praise the Lord that I have this opportunity to be here to share the word of the Lord with you guys for this camp meeting. Um, the Valley of Decision will be what we will be talking about in this presentation. But as it is my custom to do, before I like to open the word of God, I like to always go to God in prayer. And so if you would please bow your heads with me, let's go to God in prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be present with us here this evening. Father in heaven, Lord, we wanna thank you so much for all of your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus and Calvary's cross. And Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be present with us here today. Lord, we have enjoyed marvelous and beautiful messages thus far. From Brother Phipps to Gallimore to Brother Rafferty, to Sister Jill, Lord, you've been blessing tremendously. But Lord, we pray that as we enter into another study that you would bless as you have in those the same. Continue to move magnanimously in our lives. Transform our characters, O God. And help us, Lord, as we are brought to the valley of decision to make the right decision and to go whithersoever you are, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before I dive into the book that I'm going to be focusing on uh, this evening, the book of Joel. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Joel. That's where we will be spending the majority of our time. I wanted to give you a quick recap of the historicity of the nation of Israel and everything that they really dealt with and went through. And I won't be able to go through everything, obviously, but I'm going to give you just a, a, a synopsis, a snippet of the nation of Israel and what they were going through. You see, you might remember a man by the name of Abraham. Father Abraham. He's called Father Abraham because he was the father of a huge nation. Uh, and, and Abraham had a, you know, he, him and his wife, Sarah, they had a problem. They, she was barren. She couldn't have a child. God gave them a promise that I will give you a seed and his name shall be called Isaac. And, and your descendants will be like the stars of the sky, like the sands of the sea. I'm going to bless you abundantly. And, and it didn't look like that promise was going to happen. But in time, God came through on his promise. Who says Amen. God always comes through on his promise. My family used to sing a song years ago that we serve an on-time God. Yes, we do. Amen? And God always came through on his promises. As he did with Abraham, he will do for us today. But what happened with Abraham is Abraham eventually has a son named Isaac. Isaac ends up having two sons. What were their names? Esau and Jacob. I got it backwards, right? Esau and Jacob. Then you got some saying Jacob and Esau. Well, what happened was that Jacob ends up having the birthright. He ends up having this, the, these sons come forth out of him that became known as the 12 tribes of what? Israel, Israel right? You, right? You might remember the first time we see the word Israel actually come up in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 32. This is where Jacob has his wrestling match with God. And as he's wrestling with God, he ends up, you know, getting a name change take place. And sometimes if you, you and I will wrestle with God, even in those tough times, Jesus will bless you. Can you say amen? amen? God says, or Jacob said to God, rather, I will not let you go until you bless me. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, which meant deceiver. Your name shall be called what? Israel. Israel. And from that moment onward, the Israelites became a, a very magnificent nation and would move on to do wonderful things, but also give us all kinds of whiplash in the 39 books of the Old Testament. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Woo, come on now. You read, I mean, you read throughout the 39 books of the Old Testament, and what you see is just like the children of Israel is like a high school relationship. <laughs> Have mercy. How many of you remember high school? Oh, man, I detested high school. I despised high school. I couldn't wait to graduate and get out of high school because everybody in my school was with a new girl, and all the girls were with a new guy every other week. How many of you know what I'm talking about? right? It, it would all be about Dylan and Savannah, right? Dylan's the captain of the football team, and Savannah's the captain of the cheerleading squad, and, and everybody's talking about Dylan and Savannah, and all the girls want to be like Savannah, and all the guys want to be like Dylan. Well, in high school, what, one of the things I couldn't stand about it was that, again, everybody was with someone else every other week, and it wasn't long before Dylan and Savannah, the most popular two kids in school, would be busted up, and you would hear all the girls, you know, walking around and, 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 and complete, you know, pandemonium and chaos over Savannah. Oh, oh my goodness. I can't believe that Dylan would do that to you, Savannah. 
Dylan went and hooked up with a girl from another school, another cheerleader across the way. And all the chaos would take loose in school, and then it would be, Dylan and Savannah has busted up, and that's the big drama of the age. And only three weeks later, Dylan and Savannah's back together again. <laughs> uh-huh. You guys remember what it was like. And, and this, was, this was just ongoing. And, you know, I, I, me and my brother, I praise God for the way my parents raised us. They taught us the greatest gift you can ever give your future wife is your virginity. Amen? Amen. Now, not all of us could say that we had that upbringing, but I praise the Lord for me and my brother having that upbringing. We had godly parents that loved us. They said, the greatest gift you can ever give your future wife is your virginity. To say that you've only been with her, the greatest gift you can ever give her. And I thought, man, yeah, that's powerful. You know what? That's the greatest gift my bride could ever give me too. To know that she, I, she's only been with me and we just stay together like, like peas and carrots. Like, man, this is just, this is what I want. I want that faithfulness, right? How many of you would have been okay moving forward if your husband or your wife would have said, look, you know, um, yeah, we can get married and all, but I'm still going to have my side chick? Anybody? Uh-uh. No. You'd have been like, no, let's put the brakes on here for a moment. I, I'm not interested in sharing you with someone else. And as you get throughout the 39 books of the Old Testament, literally the children of Israel were like a high school relationship. They couldn't make up their mind if they wanted to serve God or not serve God, to love God or not love God, to disobey God or to obey God. And it's just like, what is going on with the nation of Israel? Well, I bring you to the story of Joseph. Right? right? Jacob has his 12 sons. Joseph is, is the, the one who has the gift and the spirit of prophecy. And Joseph is, is, ends up betrayed by his brothers. He ends up in Egypt. And what transpires was that Joseph, basically, he, he, he gets over in Egypt, right? He ends up a slave in Egypt. And he had this dream that his brothers would come and they would have to come to him, right? And that dream was ultimately fulfilled. And that the great famine hit in the land. Remember the, the famine of, of seven fatted calf, or the, 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 the uh, dream, rather, that Pharaoh had of seven fatted calf followed by the seven scrawny calf. And the seven fat ears of corn followed by the seven scrawny ears of corn. And what transpired was that that meant a seven years of plenty would, be follow, would come and followed by seven years of, of famine. And what, what happened in that story was that Joseph now was able to collect and develop enough food for everyone in the known world to have food during that time. It was a beautiful thing. Salvation was brought to the world. Listen, guys. Salvation was brought to all of the known world by a man by the name of Joseph who had a connection of a righteousness with Jesus Christ. Do you think God's wanting to save the world in the last days the same way? He's wanting to use godly men and women to raise us up that our connection with Jesus, he might show us the plan of salvation in the last days. And as we, as we, as we see what happened in the story of Joseph, the Israelites, they, they, uh, they end up coming, right? His brothers from another mother end up coming and, and they show up and what happens? They, they get there to, in Egypt and, and they, you know, they set up shop after they be reunited with Joseph. They have this beautiful ceremony of forgiveness and mercy and just, you know, contrite hearts for what they did to their brother, broken and contrite hearts. And they, they have reconciliation with Joseph. And then Joseph says, look, guys, look, all the land is here before us. You guys can stay here with me. Now, listen, there is a great difference between what God desires for you and I and what God will allow for you and I. You, you picking, what I'm, what I'm, picking up what I'm laying down here? You smelling what I'm cooking? There is a huge difference between what God desires for you and I and what God allows for you and I. God did not want what, what was about to transpire to take place, but Joseph, he wants to be with his family. He's got this leadership here. But was that Joseph's land? Was that the promised land? Do this right here. Let me help you out. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. No, it wasn't the promised land. Let's face it. They left the promised land to come to Egypt to get food because, right, the, 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 land, the land had been desolated in Egypt. The, the plan of salvation was there with Joseph. But what happened was that instead of them getting their food and, and then surviving the famine, when the famine was done, they knew how long it was going to last. Seven years. Go back home. Come on, somebody, say amen. amen. Go back home. But they got over in Egypt, and they started looking around in Egypt, and they were like, whoo. 
look at this. They got Costco. Right here, they got Costco. Whole Foods. They got Sam's Club. We ain't got to travel on our donkeys and on our camels too far to get to where we need to go. That's right. Wish we could just set up shop right here. Well, what did that lead to for the children of Israel? Slavery was not God's plan for them to be in Egypt, but God allowed it. And God prophesied it, of course, in the time of Abraham that this would happen because he knows what decisions you and I are going to make before we make them. But God does not use his omnipotence to interfere with mine and your decision. Still mine and your decision, beloved. What decision will thou makest? So as we look at the historicity of, of, of the children of Israel, as now they have been brought into this captivity, God raises up a man by the name of Moses. And Moses, a powerful man of God, he comes and he tells Pharaoh, let God's people go. Right? He says, I don't know your God. He's like, you're going to get to know him. <laughs> and guess what? Through this rebellious decision that Pharaoh made, not only did Pharaoh and the Egyptians get to know the God and that, and, that, and that the Israelites got to be reintroduced to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but the entire known world heard about what happened in Egypt. Isn't that right, beloved? The entire known world heard what happened in Egypt. And what had transpired was that basically all of the land had heard of the wonders of Egypt and they were trembling in their boots because the God of the Israelites is a mighty and a powerful God who saves. But we have to choose the salvation. We have to choose salvation to be saved. God desires, he's not willing that any should perish, but that how many? All. All should come to repentance, my friends. But oftentimes what happens is that we don't make the right choices. We seek for happiness in all the wrong places. When Thomas Jefferson penned the words on, on the Declaration of Independence, he put to life, liberty, and the what? Pursuit, Pursuit of happiness. When he, when he etched those words on the Declaration of Independence, he was implying that we are all pursuing happiness. And isn't that true? We all are wanting happiness. We all want our happy meters to be filled up, but the problem is we look in all of the wrong places to be happy. God is saying, come on, my people, wake up and see that you can only quench your thirst by the fountain of life. It's a good message. But what transpires is that God does this wonderful work in Egypt. He brings the children of Israel out of bondage and he brings them to the base of Mount Sinai. And open your Bibles with me. Just keep your spot there in Joel. We are about to come right back to Joel. But let's go now to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Open your Bibles there. And we're going to begin reading in verse 3. Exodus chapter 19, beginning in verse 3. This is where God makes the covenant with the nation of Israel. Now, God had made a covenant with Abraham, but this is the first time God is making a corporate covenant with the entire nation of Israel. Are we together, saints? All right, notice verse 3, Exodus 19, verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. He's reminding them of, his, of their past victories. And he says, Now therefore, if ye o will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Notice, them being God's peculiar people was based upon a decision. What are we talking about, beloved? The valley of what? Decision. decision. Them being God's peculiar people was based upon a decision. It was based upon a decision of to obey God or to disobey God. If you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then you shall be a peculiar treasure unto me because all of the earth is mine. Verse 6 is the key verse we're going to be paying attention to. What was the purpose for the nation of Israel? Then you shall be unto me a kingdom of what? Pre a kingdom of what? Pri Hold on a second. I thought the priesthood was only for the tribe of Levi. 
He didn't say a tribe of priests. God's initial original plan for the children of Israel was for the nation of Israel to be a bright light to the other nations of the world that had heard about the glories of God that took place in Egypt. Can we say amen? amen? Beautiful. You shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And then if you go on to read, the, ch the children of Israel heard the words of God, and they said, all the Lord has spoken, we will do. This is the problem, by the way, with you and I. We don't keep covenants very well. How many times have you made a, a promise to God and only a day later ended up breaking it? Because, you see, salvation is not about the promise that you and I make to God. It's about the promise that God makes to us. And we just need to do what Sister Jill just preached about. Amen? And we need to lay our head on his chest and trust him. God, you will deliver. God, you will work victory. God, you will do what is magnanimous and wonderful. And so, beloved... Israel was supposed to what? Be a bright light to those other nations. God had taken them, or what had transpired, again, they had left their, 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 their land, right? The promised land was over here. They left the promised land, and they went over in Egypt, and they were like, ooh, we're here in Egypt, right? They got the big screen TVs. They got Wi-Fi. They got everything we need right here in Egypt. Costco and Whole Foods and the whole nine yards. They set up shop in Egypt, while that was taking place, and they go under hundreds of years of, 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 of again, calamity and, and slavery and all of that, right, and oppression, Satan now knows where the promised land is. And he's jumping Jehoshaphat. He can't wait because he knows God's going to keep his promise, and he's going to bring that people back over here to the promised land. So what does Satan do? I'm going to go get as much heathen nations as I can. And I'm going to bring them right back here to the promised land. Because I know God's going to keep his promise. And he's going to try to save those, those Egyptians over there. And he's going to try to bring them back over here. And let me tell you something, beloved. Here was God's great struggle. God had no problem setting Israelites free from Egypt in a sense. Okay, are you with me? God was able to deliver the Israelites directly out of Egypt in one day. But it took God 40 years to get Egypt out of them. Amen? This is God's great problem. He's saying, there's an internal issue and I got to deal with it. And so now, as they are to go, they're in the base of Mount Sinai. God's saying, listen, I'm going to take you back to the promised land, but I can't take you back to the promised land while you're still acting like some Egyptians. So I have to cleanse you. I have to do the work of cleansing. Here's my character. What happens in chapter 20? Here's my law. This is who I am. Now, listen, guys. Now you know me. And you've agreed to keep the covenant. Go. And as you get over there, remember, you're not to let them convert you. You are to convert them. Amen? Amen? Oh, but what happens? Instead of Israel converting to hostile nations, because again, they're supposed to be a kingdom of priests, a holy nation. When they go back to the promised land, they're supposed to be showing forth the, the glory and the character of God in their lives to these other nations. But what transpires is right the opposite. Instead of them converting the other nations, the other nations converted them. Exactly what God said was going to happen. He warned them. He said, listen, don't, 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 don't you intermarry with them. He even told him in Deuteronomy, he said, don't you cheat on me. Now, I praise God, I've never had to say to my wife, don't you cheat on me. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. God didn't want his nation to cheat on him. He didn't want his people to cheat on him. But no, notice now, let's, let's look at what happens in the book of Joel. Go with me to Joel chapter 1. This is bringing about now the time period that God had ultimately prophesied would happen. If the children of Israel disobeyed him, he opens up with chapter 1 with a time period of devastation. Joel begins with a devastating famine that was actuated by Judah's disobedience to God. Now, beloved, listen. We're living in a time period of famine now. I'm not going to get into my other brothers' messages, but we're living in a time period of famine now. 
famine of hearing God's word and obeying it. Now we know next to nothing about the book of Joel, or about not the book of Joel. We know next to nothing about Joel the prophet, and and the time of which he wrote. We know very little about both of those. And there's all kinds of different ideas of of, of what the time period of Joel might have been in. But as I studied very, very intensely this book from the time I was given the invitation to be a part of this camp meeting, I I believe that the time period of Joel more in, more uh, more significantly was around the time period right before up to the time period when the nation of Judah was about to be captured by the nation of Babylon. All right, so, so go with me to Joel chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 1. The word of the Lord came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. Hear this, ye old men, and give ear, all ye inhabitants of the land. Hath this been in your days, or even the days of your fathers? Tell ye your children of it, and let your children tell their children, and their children another generation. Something, something big's happening. Notice what he says in verse 4. That which the palmer worm hath eaten, uh, that which the palmer worm hath left, rather, hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left, hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. Now listen, guys, this is, what's happening is a devastating, monumental famine has entered the land. Almost like nothing they've ever seen before. Now verses 5 and 6 goes on to tell us why this famine come. But I want to submit to you, turn with me to your Bibles real quick to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. What we just read in verses 1 through 4 is a fulfillment of a prophecy that God gave himself in Deuteronomy chapter 28. Go with me to Deuteronomy 28 and look at verse 15 with me. God prophesied that this exact thing would happen in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28 verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I have commanded thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, you go read the rest of Deuteronomy 28, and it's, all, it's everything that the entire 39 books of the Old Testament encompasses of what happened to the nation of Israel is fulfilled pretty much in Deuteronomy 28. It's pretty amazing. Jump to verse 38 with me now. Verse 38. We're in Deuteronomy 28. We're in verse 38. Thou shalt not carry much seed out into the field, he says. This is what will happen if you disobey God. But little in. For the locust shall what? Consume it. Thou shalt plant vineyards and dress them, but shall neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes. For the worm shall eat them. Palm worm, canker worm. Are you guys seeing this? God prophesied this well in advance. The worm shall eat them, he says. Verse 40. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all the coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil. For thine oil shall cast his fruit. Thou shalt beget sons and daughters, but thou shalt not enjoy them, for they shall go into what? Captivity. Captivity. Isn't this what happened around the time period of Babylon? Mm Mm-hmm. All the trees and fruit of thy land shall be, shall the locust consume. This is exactly what we see happening in Joel. Now go back to Joel 1, and we're going to continue onward, and notice what takes place. God is talking about a time period of famine that's come upon the land. Verses 5 and 6 goes on to say, Awake, ye drunkards, and weep, and how all ye drinkers of wine. I find it interesting that Joel's warning of this, because in Revelation 17, who is in Revelation 17 with a great cup in her hand, full of a wine, filthiness of her fornication, trying to cause the whole world to drink of that wine, to get you tipsy on the wine of Babylon. Have mercy. The Bible says in Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Isn't that right? We all have been a little tipsy on the wine of Babylon if not once, twice, or maybe three times in our lives. Verse 6. Oh, I'm sorry, the rest of verse 5 says, Because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth, the new wine was a symbol of the new covenant of which the children of Israel rejected. Are you following me, beloved? God wants to write his law in our hearts and in our minds. That was the purpose of the nation of Israel. He wanted them to be a people transformed inwardly first and then outwardly. But they did not surrender to God completely. Jeremiah 5 prophesied of that nation that would do exactly what we just read in verses 5 and 6. Now notice verse 6 says, For a nation has come upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the chief teeth of a great lion. Now there's two major primary characters in the Bible this references as a lion. Peter warns of one, the devil like a roaring what? Lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour, right? That's why he said, be sober, be vigilant. 
Cons- you know what? You know what you can consider these, these mi- majoring in the minor presentations to be? God's AA meeting. <laughs> God's trying to get us sober who may have been drinking on, on, on grandma's old cough medicine. Amen? The other symbol of a lion represents Babylon. We see this in Daniel chapter 7, in which it is not peculiar to our ideological framework here as Adventist Christians, most of us in here, of course. Joel 1, verse 7 goes on to say, He hath laid my vine waste and barked my what? My fig tree. He hath made it clean, bare, cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. So notice he's talking about he hath laid my vine waste. This is speaking of that enemy, that nation that has come upon them, that lion nation that hath the, the, the cheek teeth of a great lion. This is believed by many theologians to be represented by Babylon. So this gives us an idea of the time period that Joel was prophesying about. Now the vine represents God's people. Notice he said he had laid my vine what? Waste. The vine represents God's people. Jeremiah 2 and verse 21. Turn there with me your Bibles. Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. I'll give you a moment to turn. Notice what God says to his his children. In uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 21. He says, yet I have planted thee a noble what? Vine. What is Joel saying has been laid waste in verse 7? My vine hath been laid waste, God says. Notice what he says to the children of Israel in Jeremiah 2.21. Yet I have planted thee a noble vine, holy, a right seed. And then listen to God's tone here. God is heartbroken over his people. How then art thou turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? Ooh. Are you with me? God is looking at at, at the children of Israel situation and he's saying, how did you become like this? This isn't what I planted. Are you following? You might remember the parable of the sower. Who planted the tares? The enemy planted the tares. God plants the good seed and God God is sitting there saying, how did you turn into this? This isn't how I planted you. You've turned into the degenerate plant of a strange vine into me. How many of you remember the story of Jesus walking? Remember, it talks about the vine and the fig tree in this, in this, and Joel 1, 7. How many of you remember when Jesus came up to the fig tree? Remember that story? Jesus shows up to that fig tree, and what is he looking for? He's looking for some figs, isn't he? And he comes up to this fig tree, and he's looking for some figs, but the problem is, he doesn't find any. Jesus comes looking for fruit. He doesn't find any. What happened to that fig tree? That moment, when Jesus showed up, are you hearing me, guys? That moment when Jesus showed up, Jesus cursed the fig tree because it was fruitless. What kind of fruits are you and I supposed to have in these last days? Fruit of the Spirit. Can someone say amen? But you know why we don't have the fruit of the Spirit? Because we don't have the Spirit. That's why it's called the fruit of the Spirit. You don't have the fruit because we don't have the Spirit. Amen? You have the Spirit of God. You will, no doubt about it, have the fruit. He comes up to a fig tree that's fruitless, and Jesus curses the fig tree. And the Bible says within that very hour when they passed back by, the fig tree had withered completely and died. That is what will be our end. If we do not make the correct decision when we enter into the valley of decision. Jesus is coming soon. And he's going to be looking for some fruit. Can somebody say amen? Amen. Now, how did this happen to God's people? We talked about it. But let's just revisit it. Because it's all throughout the Bible. How did this, this barrenness happen? God is looking at his people and their spiritual ruin everywhere. God is saying, what's going on? Well, in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 20, you were in Jeremiah 2 earlier. We read verse 21. Let's read verse 20 now. He says, For all time I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidest, I will not transgress. You ever made that that promise to God? God, I'm not going to sin anymore. When he goes on to say, When upon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest playing the harlot. You know what he means by every high hill and every green tree? Because there's some people that's not ashamed of their sin whatsoever. 
He'll do it right out in the open, just like Absalom did with David's wives. Mm-hmm. And then there's some that want to pretend that they are a Christian, putting on that mask Jill talked about. But in reality, what happens? Sinless, sinless lifestyle, or rather a sinful lifestyle is being lived and practiced and promulgated in their private lives. God has said here, listen, when upon every high hill and every green tree, thou is wondrous playing the what? The harlot, he says. Now, there's a character in the Bible I want to just bring our minds back to. His name was Solomon. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 11. 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. 1 Kings chapter 11. We're going to begin reading in verse 1. Notice what happens to King Solomon. Now, Solomon was, other than God, other than Jesus Christ, according to Scripture, he was the wisest in the Bible. Isn't that true? Other than Jesus Christ, because Jesus is really the wisest. But Solomon, notice what it says about him in 1 Kings 11, verse 1. But King Solomon loved many strange women. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, w- women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Zidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, You shall not go in unto them, neither shall they come in unto you, for surely they will turn away your what? heart after their gods, Solomon clave unto these in love, the Bible says. He clave unto these women in love because, let's face it, just like the the, the sons of God in Genesis chapter 6, how many of you remember the flood, right? Genesis chapter 6. Well, what caused the flood? Think about this for a moment. In Genesis chapter 6, what caused the flood, you go read Genesis 6 verses 1 and 2, it says, and the sons of God saw the daughters of God do this right here. No, they weren't the daughters of God. Who were they? The daughters of men. These sons of God, the Bible says in, in, in uh, 1 John chapter, uh, or John chapter 1 verse 12, that you must accept Jesus and live by him to be a son of God. Romans 8 and verse 14 tells us that we must walk by the spirit of God to be a son of God. So that's not talking about fallen angels, by the way. Amen. It says the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and they took them wise of all of which they chose. So what happened was that the the lineage of Seth, right, because Seth replaced Abel, they were looking over at the land of Nod. You know why they call it the land of Nod? That's the kind of people like to nod off in church. (laughs) Amen? Don't be nodding off in church. We'll say, we got a Nodamite over here. Nodamite right here. So listen. The sons of God looked over at the daughters of men. That was the lineage of Cain dwelling in the land of Nod. And, and what had transpired was that they saw them, it says the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair and they took them wise of which they chose. What was happening is that the, the, the lineage of Cain, remember Cain left the presence of God in Genesis chapter four. And he dwelt over in the land of Nod. And he said, I don't want anything to do with God. God doesn't want to accept my, my, uh, you know, my, my fruits, my vegetables, my works. I'm going to go and live how I want to live then. I'm going to separate myself from God. That's not what God wanted for Cain. That's not what God wants for anybody. But that's what Cain's decision was. But the sons of God saw the daughters of men, and they said, because when they saw them, they thought, man, those women don't dress like our women. Are you with me? They don't look like our women. And so they started intermarrying. Well, what happened with Solomon in verse 3, notice, it says, And he had 700 wives. Woo! And 300 concubines. And his wives turned away his what? This is what God said would happen. His wives turned away his heart. Now, it said he has 700 wives and 300 what? What in the world is a concubine? Let me tell you. A concubine is a side chick. Let me give you the, 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 that's the new age term, right? We call it side chick. But in the 1950s, they called it a mistress. Ah, uh, some of you is like, oh, okay. I get you. Right? Side chick. Now, you might be familiar with the very popular TV show back in the 1950s called The Andy Griffith Show. Us Adventists don't know nothing about The Andy Griffith Show, do we? Don't kid yourself. I know you go watch it every Sabbath. 
I had to throw that in there. Now listen, on the Andy Griffith show, there was a famous character. He was the main reason why, let's face it, everybody watched the show. His name was Barney Fife. Don Knotts played the character of Barney Fife. And Barney Fife, he had Thelma Lou as his girl. Isn't that right? Yeah. Thelma Lou was his girl. She was his honey. And they were working out trying to get ready for marriage, right? But then you would see episodes show up where Barney's not singing to Thelma Lou. He's singing to old Juanita at the diner. <laughs> Guys, here's the point. The point is, do you have a Juanita in your life? Do you have a side chick? I'm not talking literal, I'm talking spiritual here. Do you have, do you have something? You should be with God, but you're, you got you a Juanita. You be singing songs to Juanita. Mm-hmm. Jesus is creeping up behind you like Andy Griffith and saying, hey, you're supposed to be with Thelma Lou. Amen? You're supposed to be faithful to me. You see, my friends, God sees that the, his people are not ready for him, and he's, he's t- terrified. God wants his people to be ready. He wants his people to be surrendering because God can't let this go on much longer. You do realize that, right? In Matthew chapter 24, it says that about the days of Noah, that, n- that, that unless those days should have been shortened, no flesh would have been saved. Because the wickedness becomes so gross and so hostile in the land that they would wipe out every single person that doesn't think like them. Are you with me? This is what's coming up on planet Earth, my friends. And we need to be very careful that we we, we keep our focus on God. Now, I won't have you to turn here for the sake of time, but you know the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8, that God wrote Israel a certificate or a bill of divorce. You say, what? You can go read it in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 8. I'll read it for you. He says, And I saw when when for all the causes whereby backsliding Israel committed adultery, I put her away and given her a bill of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah... Now, who is Joel addressing? Judah. Are you following? Her treacherous sister Judah feared not, but went went, uh, went and played the harlot also. Again, bringing those Juanitas in the picture. Amen? Joel 1, 10 and 11 goes on to say, The field is wasted, the land mourneth, the corn is wasted, the new wine is dried up, the oil languisheth. Verse 11, Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen, and how, ye vine dressers, for the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. God is showing his people a literal version of what has taken place within their very own lives spiritual barrenness, spiritual ruin. You know, and as I look across the religious scene today, even in my own church, I'm not seeing much fruit amongst the midst of God's people. And I speak that to our shame. And I speak this message not only to you guys, as if it's all you. This message is for just as much as the ministers of the church as it is for everyone else. We're going to talk about the ministers now in just a bit. God is seeing this, this inward situation. Notice verse 12. The vine is dried up, the fig tree languisheth, and the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. You go read Psalm 16, verse 11. It says the joy is the presence of God. What's happened? How do we get in this situation? We have left the presence of God. That's why. Worship services are as dry as the hills of Gaboa. Why would we worship happily when we don't know God? Amen? Why? Trees is what he talks about is is languishing and, and having no fruit. When Luke 3 verse 9, John the Baptist said, the axe is also laid into the root of the what? Trees. He was speaking of people. The axe is laid into the root of the tree. Every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and is cast into the fire, John says. Revelation 7 verse 3 talks about hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. God's people. 
till we have sealed the servants of our God, where? In the forehead. Now, beloved, what's the forehead a symbol of? Forehead is a symbol of the mind, is it not? It's where we make decisions. See, God is dealing with spiritual ruin in Joel's day. He addresses the leadership. Go with me to verses 13 and 14. He says, Gird yourselves and lament, you priests. How, you ministers of the altar. Come, lie all night in sackcloth, you ministers of my God. You know why God would have them on the day of atonement to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Because he was saying, if you, if you do not turn back to me, that's what you're going to become. What were we made of? Of the dust of the earth. Sanctify fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry unto the Lord. Now, jump down with me to Joel 2 and verse 23. We're going to go to Joel chapter 2, or we're going to jump to verse 23. Let me, let me share with you what God says he will do if we repent. This is what, and I can't cover all of Joel, I, have mercy. None of us speakers up here are going to be able to cover all of the profundity of the minor prophets. There's no way. Not with what time we have, but we're going to give you the, the, the juiciest parts we can. Amen? Amen. Mm. Joel 2, verse 23, is what will happen, the result of when we repent. Notice, he says, Be glad then, ye children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to come down for you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain in the first month. Yeah. Amen. And beloved, why haven't we received this latter rain pouring that we've been waiting on for so long? You probably already know, but we haven't done anything about it. So we need to hear it again. Amen? Yeah. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 3 says, Therefore the showers have been withholden, and there hath been no latter rain. And thou hast a whore's forehead, and refusest to be ashamed. Why has there not been a latter rain? Why have the showers been withholding and there has been no lot of rain? Jeremiah 3.3 3 says, because the showers have been withholding because you have a whore's forehead and refuses to be ashamed. He says this to us, spiritual Israel in the last days. We have gone a whoring. We have playing the harlot with God. God's heart is broken and he's saying, my people, please come back to me. The author and the finisher of your faith. You see, you and I think we can write happy endings, but the reality is God is the author and he's the finisher of our faith. Amen. We have had the pen in our hands too long. Come on, somebody. We've had the pen in our hands too long trying to write our own happy endings. And God is saying, if you would just give me the author and finisher of your faith, the pen, only I can write happy endings. Amen? Amen? God promises us, a, uh, us to, uh, promises us rather to use us mightily. Notice Joel 2, 28. This is probably the one scripture we all know very well in Joel. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And your young men shall see what? How many of you wait for, can't wait for that day? Has that happened yet? Do this right here. It's only happened, as, as Joel said, it's only happened moderately. Are you following? Because this is using plural terminology. He says, I will pour out my spirit on your sons, plural. On your daughters, plural. Right? The old men shall dream dreams. The young men shall see visions. I'm, I'm scared and I'm, 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 even, I'm even sad to say it. But I think the only dream many of us have been having in these last days is the American dream. We're living in a time period, we're supposed to be having dreams and visions, and the only dreams we've been having is the American dream. You know why they call it the American dream? Because you've got to be asleep to believe it. <laughs> Amen? And we're supposed to be having visions in the last days, but I think, I'm afraid to say, but the only vision many of us have been having is television. You see, we have been too caught up in the net of flicks. too caught up in the net of flicks that we can't see all of the prophecies that's being fulfilled around us. The time is short. We've caught up in the net of flicks, beloved. You know what we need to do? Matthew chapter 4, verse 20. You go read it when you get a chance. I'll, I'll quote it for you. It says, when Jesus called the disciples, they left their nets and followed him. Yeah. 
We got some nets to forsake. Decisions are the hardest thing to make, especially when it is a choice between where you should be and where you want to be. A decision develops an action. An action develops a habit. A habit develops a character. And a character develops your destiny. God has brought us to the valley of decision, my friends. What decision will you make? As we move onward, waiting the coming of God. Joel 3, 14, the, where we got the very profound statements for the term, the valley of decision. Joel 3, 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. What decision will you make? You know, as I near these, these end of times, I realize I'm not where I need to be. How many of you can say that? But I look back and I say, praise God, I'm not where I was. And I'm reminded, and I tell people, when I let people down, I tell people, hey, listen, I'm still in the oven. God is still in the kitchen cooking on me. And when God is done cooking on me, he's going to open that oven. And he's going to say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Who says Amen. You say, but man, how in the world, Dakota, how in the world am I going to get to that point? I've sinned much sin. I've, done, I've fallen away from God. Well, welcome to the club. Amen. I'm reminded of a powerful story, a true story. It took place in the 18th century in England. A man by the name of Robert Robinson. True heckler he was in his day as a young man. Robert Robinson, he, he didn't have a relationship with God. He was without a father. He was a troubled child. And, and he found it much great joy to go to all the local uh, pastors in the land and, the, and the, the evangelists and the tent meetings and the camp meetings that they would have. And he would heckle and he would shout and yell profanities at the preacher and say, you're just a hypocrite like everyone else. And he would just chase away. He, he was quick-witted, very smart, very intelligent young man. He knew more vocabulary words than all the preachers in England put together. He was so intelligent. And he would chase all the way the preachers out of the land. Well, one day he showed up to the wrong camp meeting. George Whitfield was there in England preaching in the 1700s. George Whitfield was there. And as soon as he saw the young man walk in, they had told him about Robert Robinson. And he said, young man, sit down. And give me a moment to tell you about Jesus. And if you don't like what you hear, he said, well, then that's fine. You just move on and do what you want to do. Robert had never been challenged, so he sat down. George Whitfield began to preach. Five minutes passed, 10 minutes passed, 15 minutes passed. Before you know it, a whole hour passed. And George Whitfield called the decision, and he said, Brood of vipers, who's warned you to flee of the wrath to come? That stirred the heart of Robert Robinson. Years later, he ended up becoming a Christian, giving his life fully to God. He became a changed man. And he started ministering on behalf of everyone else that, that, that he had heard through the gospel of Christ. He started to, to preach the gospel to the world. Well, Robert Robinson, years later, he ended up backsliding, making a bad decision in his life. What transpired in that story was Robert Robinson went years, went 40 years into sin away from God. One day, he's, on the, he's, he's, on, he's walking on the the side road of England on the way to the local tavern, which was right across from the church, a little old lady stops by in her wagon and she says, sir, would you like to come to church with me today? She says, you can hitch a ride with me. He said, uh, uh, sure. He had no intentions of going to church. He was just going to go to the local tavern and drink it up. He hops on the wagon and the little old lady, she begins to sing the song, come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call for songs of loudest praise. And as she began to sing the song, Robert Robertson began to weep. He was weeping, and she said, Sir, do you not like my voice? He said, No, ma'am, it's not that. <laughs> she goes, You don't like the song? He goes, Oh, it's not that either. He said, It's that I wrote it. <laughs> True story. I wrote it. She goes, You're Robert Robertson? She looks at her hymnal. He says, I sure am. She says, what happened? He says, oh, I fell away from God many years ago, and I never surrendered my life back to God. He said, I, I, I'm too sinful to come to God, too great of a sinner. He said, in that song I, I wrote, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, 
She said, but yeah, but then you wrote, take your, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. She said, God didn't leave you, you left God. And God created this divine appointment for me and you, for you to be reminded that you could never be greater of a sinner than Jesus as a Savior. Jesus is coming soon. What do you say? I want to be ready. Let's make a right decision to come back to him. Amen.